Turn, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 tonight. I managed to hit the button, turn the microphone off this morning, so we had to go to the pulpit mic, and it is just one of my many, many failings. I'm sure I've told you this. I'm sure I've told you this many times when I was 18. Before we ever got saved, I, I worked with my very best friend, and we had graduated high school together. And in 1975, the Air Force had a program that you would be guaranteed to go through boot camp together if you enlisted together. And so we worked at the same little shoe store, and we got mad at the boss one day, and we decided we were going to go down and join the Air Force. And uh, <clears throat> that was when I was first diagnosed with having high blood pressure. I got booted out and. Tommy got sent to Guam, but I took all the battery of tests, and the recruiter said to me, well, you can do anything except unless it has to do with electronics, and then you can't touch it. So that has been uh, pretty much true my whole life. So I turned buttons off when I shouldn't. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4, let's go ahead and stand, please. And I want to read the first five verses. Uh, will be our text this evening. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse number 1. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. For I know nothing, nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray again that you would help us in this time, Lord, and that it would be true that your word would shape our thinking and our speaking and our acting, that we would be filled with the word of God by the spirit of God, and that... All that we do then would be pleasing to you. And I pray that you would help us in dealing with this text this evening, both to grasp it and to obey it. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may, of course, be seated. Well, a few weeks ago, um, we began on Sunday nights to just turn our attention to human judgment. We know that we're going to be judged of the Lord. Paul makes reference to the fact that we will be judged of the Lord in this passage this evening, but, but what I want to focus on is not that as much as it is the kind of human judgments that we make um, about a variety of things. Um, and, and part of being an adult is just is doing that and doing that properly. We were out at our daughters in Fremont last night and our other daughter was out there and there are six young children running around and fireworks and things to light fireworks and I know that I'm getting old because I was just you know you could just see tragedy Uh, you know it was just oozing everywhere Uh, six-year-olds running around with uh, you know the lighted punks you know I mean I don't know if there's a more technical word to use to light the fireworks and then the fireworks going off and I just thought boy this <clears throat> get the phone set to 911 and speed dial uh, <clears throat> ready to go. <clears throat> Part of being an adult is making uh, judgments. And, and when, you <clears throat> when you add into that our sinfulness, um, we don't always make good judgments. We make a lot of judgments. And I've jokingly said, but it's not really quite a joke, is that one of the reasons that I began to undertake this series is that we are considered to be by many people a judgmental church, which is by itself a form of judgment. 
um, which only highlights and magnifies to me the complexity of the issue. And I, I think, folks, as we walk through a variety of passages, we will see what a daunting task it is before us to make judgments and to make them well, and to do that in light of the recognition that the Lord is going to judge us for the judgments that we make. Um, this is not a joke. This is something that is very serious. So we began in Matthew 7, and we just kind of worked our way through that when Jesus said, judge not lest ye be not judged, that he was not making an absolute prohibition. It's not possible to live without making judgments. And in fact, such judgments are mandatory. In John 7, he said, judge righteous judgments, which requires an accurate and complete assessment of the word of God. That was where he was going with that. He was pointing out to them the inconsistencies and the way they were handling Old Testament complexities, judge righteous judgments. Um, and this evening, I want to turn our attention to this passage, and we're probably going to spend several weeks in the book of Corinthians itself because it deals with some of these kinds of judgments that we re are required to make and the way in which the Corinthians usually failed, but sometimes succeeded with them. Uh, just a quick refresher on Paul and his relationship with this church. He founded it, the very first Christian that the Corinthians ever seen was the Apostle Paul. We can read about his activity there in Acts chapter 18. And I just want to read to you two verses um, from Acts 18 and Acts 19 because they, they help us to, to understand a little bit of the issue that is going on in here. <clears throat> Acts 18.24, a certain Jew named Apollos born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. And so Paul was in Ephesus. Apollos actually ends up being in Corinth. Um, Apollos goes to Corinth. Paul goes to Ephesus. Acts 19, when it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. So these are two men. One is an apostle, one is not. Both are tremendous Christians. Both of them are involved in instruction ministry. Both of them have time at Corinth. <clears throat> and, and Apollos is, by inspired record, a man known as eloquent. He is skilled in public speaking. This is what it means. Apollos is skilled in public speaking. And there's no sin in that, by the way. There's, there's no condemnation of the fact that he was good at that. It is stated as a fact. Paul, on the other hand, goes to great lengths to explain to the Corinthians that he personally renounced anything that would even remotely come across as being worldly wise in the way he dealt with them. And you can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verse number 1. Paul writes, I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in much weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my preaching, or my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And I don't think that we should read into that any criticism of Apollos. Um, there's no hint or suggestion that Apollos, that Apollos did any of those things either. But he was definitely a different man than Paul. And it wasn't very long until the Corinthians were pitting them against each other. And that the church divided. And, and, and it, it appears it starts with Peter being in the mix, but it appears that it is primarily a division in the church between those of Paul and those of Apollos. And... <clears throat> And Paul then is taking great exception to that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 4, While one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Are you not thinking like lost people, is what he really means. Are you not thinking like lost people? He hasn't created this category. That's a whole other conversation about whether or not there exists the carnal Christian. He's just saying, you're saints, but you're, you're thinking like lost people. And it is entirely possible, folks, for us as saints to think like lost people. And, and that's what he said. You're, you're, you're thinking like lost people. To make this an Apollos 
or Paul kind of dynamic is to, is to think very much like a lost person. This was a demonstration not of their superior ability to judge, but of actually their carnality. And so Paul goes on for 1 Corinthians 3, 5. Who then is Paul, who is Apollos, but ministers? Or just servants by whom he believed? And I think what, what Paul is getting at, folks, is that Paul came into town and planted the church and people got saved under the ministry of Paul. And then Paul left and went to Ephesus and Apollos came in and Apollos preached and people got saved under Apollos. And, and then they divided <clears throat> over whether they were of Paul or of Apollos. And <clears throat> he writes, I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything. Apollos is nothing, or I'm nothing. Neither he that watereth, Apollos is nothing. But God, God is everything. It's God that gives the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. That's where Paul goes. And, and, and then he goes on, and we're not going to deal with it, but in 1 Corinthians 3, he is very plainly and clearly talking about the building of a church, not the building of an individual life. That's what's being developed there in verses 12 through verse number 23. That's what he's really referring to when he's talking about the temple, the broader facility, not facility of the buildings, but the broader context of the church, not the individual temple, but the temple that God is building that Peter talks about. <clears throat> And that brings us then to our text this evening, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 1. Let a man so account of us, then right, in the light of all of that, that some people will be saved through the ministry of Apollos, that some will be saved through the ministry of Paul, but that the one that plants and the one that waters is not anything because God is really the one who is doing all the heavy lifting. He is the one that is doing the work. So think of us in this way. This is the way to... This isn't really what the word means, but it's not a bad use of the word. Judge us then in this way as of the ministers of Christ. Think of Apollos, think of Paul as servants, and not only servants, but stewards. Stewards, those who are entrusted with something that belongs to another. Um, <clears throat> They didn't come to be original thinkers. They didn't come to preach new novel things. They came to deliver the Word of God, to teach and preach the Word of God. And then Paul goes on in verse number two, <clears throat> that it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. If you think about what the minister is, he is a steward and he is a servant well, what do we need to require of him? Well, what we need to require of him is that he be found faithful. And again, I say, folks, not novel. He doesn't need to be new because any faithful pastor knows that he has nothing new to say. The, the Bible is complete. There's, there's nothing to add to it. There's nothing to take away from it. There's nothing in it that embarrasses us. There's nothing in it for which we would apologize. There's nothing in it that is irrelevant to any generation of people at any particular point in time. We're simply stewards, and we are servants. <clears throat> but then Paul, in verses 3, 4, and 5, which is really the passage that we'll deal with this evening, alludes to the fact that he is not being judged faithful by the Corinthians. And we know that because he immediately begins to talk about the way he thinks about the way they are thinking about him. Think of me as a servant. Think of me as a steward. Understand that what is required of me is faithful. And I would point out that I think that Paul's primary concern there is a faithfulness to the Lord, not a faithfulness any other place. And it is evident in verses 3, 4, and 5 that the Corinthians do not find Paul faithful. So once again, folks, we're up against a little bit of a conundrum here. And I don't, maybe that's not the best word, a complexity to the subject. Do not judge lest ye be not judged. There are things that Jesus means there that are developed in all through 
verse one, the verse number six. We, I'm not going to go back and try and revisit that. And our judgments must be righteous, but our judgments of people, our judgments of people will always fall short. Our judgments of people will always fall short. Now, Paul will take up the subject of judgment again, and I'm not going to look at it this evening. I'm, going to get, I'm just going to make reference to it. But in chapter 5, he returns to the subject of judgment, and he criticizes the Corinthians for their failure to judge something. 1 Corinthians 6 is absolutely oozing with a variety of forms of judgment. When it comes to taking matters that belong inside the church, outside the church, into the civil or the secular courts, and he judges them for the poor way in which they do that. So Paul is not condemning all judgment. In fact, he is critical of the Corinthians for not getting this judgment thing correct. But it is possible, folks, to miss the point in judgment at both extremes by not making a judgment when one is required and by making a final judgment when one is not possible. This isn't the only place where Paul touches on judging people. In Romans 14, he deals with the subject extensively and he raises the question, why do you judge another man's servant? To his own master he falls or stands? So that my judgment of you is never final, is never complete. Your judgment of me is never final, it is never complete. It is always inadequate, no matter how confident we are. And this is part of the problem, folks. We are confident in the judgments we make about people. There is something sorely lacking. In fact, I would suggest to you from verses 3, 4, and 5 that there are three things sorely lacking. Let's look at them. First of all, <clears throat> Paul argues that human judgments of this nature are insignificant. All right, judge me this way as a servant and as a steward. Stewards have to be found faithful. Verse number three, but with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment, yea, I judge not mine own self. Human judgments are insignificant. Paul counts it the very least of things the very least of things. And in fact, let me ask you, we're going to come right back to, to chapter 4, but look, if you would, at chapter 6. In verse number 2, where the, same, where the same words are used, they're translated differently, but the same words are used. Chapter 6 and verse number 2, Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge? Here it is the smallest matters, the smallest matters. With me, 1 Corinthians 4, 3, it is the smallest matter that I should be judged by you. And he doesn't just feel that way about the Corinthians, folks. Notice there that there are three. I mean, if we were trying to outline this, that might be Roman numeral one. Human judgment is insignificant, and under that, Paul would list three points. The human judgment of the Corinthians, that I should be judged of you. The next point under that would be any human judgment or of man's judgment. And then Paul would point out, since he himself is a man, that he would include his own Self-judgment in that. So let's just, right? I mean, let's just pause for a moment, folks, because much of the judgment that we impose on people is the judgment we impose upon ourselves. So here's the biblical reality. Doesn't mean a thing. Doesn't mean a thing. That's what the Lord says. <clears throat> It is a small thing. Even the way we judge ourselves is a small thing. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. We want to make righteous judgments. We want to make sure that in our judgments we're judging the right thing, not the wrong thing. 
But Paul is arguing here, right, that human judgments are insignificant. The, Paul, the, the Corinthians, and folks, we, we dealt with this, and, and we could just run right through all the way through the end of 2 Corinthians, and it just comes up again and again and again that the Corinthians find Paul lacking. And Paul is very clear. It is an insignificant thing the judgments that you judge about me. Any human judgment from any source is really an insignificant thing. Now, I'm not saying that Paul doesn't feel the sting of it, because I think he does. If you were to be critical of me, I would feel the sting of that. If I were to be critical of you, you would feel the sting of that. I mean, I've been doing this, folks, going on 36 years now. I have never one time, to my knowledge, said to somebody, hey, can you come down to the office without invariably there being a question along the way of, am I in trouble? We feel the sting of criticism. Paul is not taking that, to me, non-existent road of, I don't care what anybody thinks about me. I think the Bible takes great exception to that. We care very much what people think about us. What Paul is arguing is that he's not going to be moved by that. He's not going to get out of bed every morning going, I have to make the Corinthians happy, or I have to make some other man happy, or I even have to make myself happy. He is going to be unfazed by that. He is not going to be paralyzed by that criticism. Oh, or, by the way, or the praise. Or the praise of someone else. I mean, really, folks, it is an insignificant thing. If everybody that we ever met loved us, it is an insignificant thing. Which leads me then to, to the second point, which, and, and the second question. Why is it insignificant? If the very best of people find you lacking... Is that really inconsequential? If the very best of people find us stellar, is that really meaningless? Is that really inconsequential? But Paul argues that the judgment of a man is an insignificant thing. It is a very small thing to him. And he goes on to explain to us why it is a small thing. Why is it a small thing? Should I be unfazed by my wife's opinions on things? In what way are they genuinely insignificant? And Paul goes on to help us. They are insignificant <clears throat> because they are inconclusive. Verse number three. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Why are human judgments insignificant? They're insignificant because they're inconclusive. I don't even judge myself, Paul says, but I don't know anything against myself. In other words, the way that we would put it, folks, and verse, verse number four reads, for I know nothing by myself. What he means is I know nothing against myself, or as we would say it, my conscience is clear. My conscience is clear. Somebody says, you know, I just don't think you're a very dedicated Christian. And we go, but my, but my conscience is clear. Now that brings us into a whole other set of issues, folks, because the Bible takes the human conscience very seriously. And in 1 Corinthians 8, Paul will talk about the obligation that we have towards the conscience of another person. And in Romans 14, Paul will argue passionately for the liberty of a man's conscience to do certain things or to deny himself certain things. Not because they are intrinsically wrong, but because one's conscience believes them to be wrong. But there are limitations to human conscience, folks. Human consciences can be seared. They can be dulled. Our consciences are to some extent conditioned by the world in which we live, by that which is normal. 
to us. So that what a conscience where its limitations are, folks, I could say to you, look, my conscience is clear. But what I'm really doing is arguing at best that I am sincere in what I believe. That's the best that I can say, is that I sincerely believe that I am doing what is required or what is right. I am standing where I ought to stand. I, I heard a man say one time, it is original with me, I, I wish I was, could think these kinds of thoughts on my own, but he said, I always think I'm right. <clears throat> but I don't think I'm always right. And the point that he was trying to make was he never stood in his pulpit and taught his people deliberately things that were wrong or falsehood. He always thought he was right, but he never thought for a moment that he could be 100% right. He knew he was a sinner. Right? I mean, I'm, I believe the things that Baptists believe. I'm a Baptist by choice. I'm a Baptist by decision. I, I'm a fundamentalist by persuasion. I think I'm right. But I don't think it's possible that I'm always right in all the things that I've just done and decided and believed in the positions that I have taken. There is a limitation to what our consciences will do. It should always, by the way, I mean, it just should always, by the way, cause us some discomfort and cause us to shudder when we defend something as if that is the end of the the matter, right? Well, I know my heart on this. And I'm not taking exception to that. You may know your heart on that, but you have to understand that it is entirely possible that your heart is 100% wrong. This This is the problem. This, this is the problem. Sin deceives me. Sin hardens me. My heart is not particularly reliable in those matters, no matter how much assurance it gives me that this is the right thing. To go back to this passage, folks, if that is true about our own selves, if the Bible reality is, and the Bible reality is, that I cannot accurately judge my own heart, how am I possibly competent to judge yours? Say, I know what you're doing. I know what you're thinking. I know why you're doing those particular things. Human judgments are insignificant because they are inconclusive. And thirdly, folks, they are inconclusive because they are incomplete. In other words, let's just suppose that human judgments really did matter and we magnified them way beyond what the Bible does. And then let us suppose that we were right in all of the judgments that we made. There is still a problem. And the problem is this, they are incomplete. Again, back to the text, <clears throat> verse number four, I, for I know nothing by myself or against myself, yet am I here not justified that doesn't make me right. He that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. So I think Paul is walking us through, again, this this progression here. I know that you judge me inadequate or in some way unfaithful. It is a very small thing. It is a very insignificant thing. It's a big thing to you, Corinthians, but it's an insignificant thing to me. And it's insignificant because it's inconclusive. Even if I'm doing the best that I can to make the right judgment, I don't get it. But let's just go out on a limb here. Let's just make for every provision, and let's say that you get it 100% right. It is still incomplete because the Lord is the judge that counts. He that judgeth me is the Lord. That's the judgment that matters. 
I mean, imagine, folks, that you're just driving along, minding your own business. As far as you know, you're not disobeying any law, and you get pulled over, and you get issued a citation. And you say to everybody that will listen to you tell the story, I'm innocent. I wasn't speeding. I didn't do it. I had my turn signal on. Something, by the way, Nebraskans don't do well. The other thing they really do terribly is merge, but that's a whole other story. But honest to goodness, folks, we need to crash course in what a merge sign means and which lane has it. Okay, this has nothing to do with anything, but this is a true story. Part of the people who, for whom it pertains are sitting here in this building this evening. We have a family there child is married. His in-laws came to visit. They were driving down Dodge Street, and a man, not from Douglas County, but from Madison County, came down the ramp and drove right into the side of his car. And when they pulled off to the side of the road, the man from Madison County said to the man, why didn't you move? I rest my case. Nebraskans don't know how to merge. And you go, but I'm innocent. I wasn't speeding. I used my turn signal. The police officer profiled me and picked upon me, picked on me because he didn't like my race or my age or my height or my weight, and he just wrote me a ticket. So what? Right? You still need the judge to make the decision. You still need to go to court and you still need to make your case. And really, there is an authority to make that decision. So the Corinthians have have an opinion about Paul. And even if they're right in that opinion, that's not the end of the matter, folks. It's incomplete because the Lord is the judge. And we are all, every one of us, is going to be judged by the Lord. Every believer is going to be judged by the Lord. You have to appear before the judge. This is, by the way, John 5, 22 and 23. This is given to the Son to validate. One of the ways that his position as deity is validated. The Father judges no man, but gives all judgment to the Son so that people will respect the Son the same way they respect the Father. John 5, 22 and 23. To go back to 1 Corinthians 5, there are things Paul points out that are required for an accurate judgment that the Lord knows that other people don't. This is the long and short of it, folks. When we are confident that we know why people have done something or why they haven't done something and we think we've got all the pieces put together and we make our summary judgment of them, here is where it is in violation. 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Therefore judge nothing before the time. What time is that? Until the Lord comes. Some things cannot be settled or determined until the Lord makes his judgment. And when he comes, this is what he will do. He will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. He will bring out into the open things that were not seen. We say, we tend to say, I see everything that I need to see to make my decision. The Lord says, no, you don't. There are things you don't say. There are things you don't know. And we say, I don't think so. And the Lord goes, I I think you're wrong. There are things you don't know. Now we'll get to this, folks. If I could just jump ahead, we'll get to this in the next chapter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Sometimes it is we are required to make judgments against people no matter what they might argue is going on in their hearts. Some things are wrong no matter how we try to defend them or explain them. But in this kind of a situation, right, here's what the Lord says to us. There are hidden things of darkness, and the Lord will also make manifest the counsels of the heart. And that word counsel means purposes. Right? The Lord will make known the purposes of the heart. What were you trying to do? 
Right? We know, folks, that the, that the ideal is, the goal to which we're all to aspire is to do everything to the glory of God. Right down to what I had for lunch today, right down to what I'm going to drink uh, <clears throat> when I get home this evening, whatever that's going to be, right? Everything to the, to the glory of the Lord. But the Lord is the one who will make the decision as to whether or not that was accomplished. And I would point out to you folks <clears throat> that Paul does not, and therefore I think we should not, read anything sinister into those two expressions. In other words, Paul is not suggesting that there lurks in the human heart some deep sinister motive that you can't see. And I say that because of the way he concludes the sentence. Verse number five, then shall every man have praise of God. In other words, Paul is clearly weighing over here that people are doing things that are, in their minds, good things, sincere things, well-intentioned things, God-honoring things. And when the Lord brings the, shines the light on that and brings it all out, the Lord is going to say, good job. And we might have gone, I can't believe you did that. Our judgments... <clears throat> are incomplete. Every man shall have praise of God. And what he means there is praise from God. Right? When we get to that judgment, folks, so, right? so here's something that you may not think about yourself very often. It is entirely possible that when you come and you are judged of the Lord, that what you will have from him is praise, commendation, This is praise worth having. <clears throat> so in this particular passage, folks, with reference to these particular things, and I, again, I think most broadly it is the kind of judgments that we are inclined to make against people when we, when we think we are assured of their motives, when we believe that we can confidently condemn what they are doing because it is most evidently, blatantly against the Lord that Paul is going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, those kind of judgments, they don't really count. Because you're probably not going to get it right. And even if you do get it right, the, the judgment that we're waiting for is the judgment of the Lord. All right, let's pray together this evening. And as we pray, Brian will come up. We'll have a closing song. Then I have a few announcements to make. And we will be dismissed this evening. Father, grant to us wisdom always, God. Righteous judgments from your word that we would make the right kind of judgments and avoid the wrong kind of judgments. That we would be mature in this, that we would be spiritually minded, filled with grace and wisdom. Grant us this, we pray, please, in Jesus' name. Amen.